Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to the first monthly Global CID webinar devoted to current debates on citizenship and electoral rights worldwide. Um, the Global Citizenship Observatory is an op online observatory that publishes databases, analysis, indicators, and debates on citizenship status and electoral rights. It relies on a large international network of country experts who write reports, collect legal documents, provide input for comparative databases. And this information also allows us to compare data across countries and over time. And with our webinar series, we aim to provide a platform for online debate and exchange between scholars and practitioners interested in citizenship, broadly understood. My name is Martin Fink and I'm the chair in citizenship studies and the director of the global citizenship research area um, of the global governance program here at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies of the European University Institute. And I would like to warm you, warmly welcome you all to this uh, webinar uh, from Florence in Italy to everyone who has tuned in from around the world today. Um, today's webinar is co-sponsored by the Institute on Statelessness uh, and Inclusion. A special thanks to one of the speakers, Laura van Waas, and addresses the topic of citizenship revocation. In many countries across the world, citizenship revocation policies are, are back on the political agenda, if they have been gone at all, while states have always had the power to revoke citizenship based on a wide ranging grounds, stripping persons of citizenship is increasingly deployed by states as counter-terrorism and deportation tool. Citizenship legislation is also used to exclude communities and restrict rights in the context of contestation of borders and national identity. And I'm really delighted that today we have five great speakers who will reflect on the concrete policy implications of citizenship stripping and on its theoretical significance. We will address from various angles the question of the challenges of this revival of citizenship revocation. Some of the presentations will actually go back further in time. Um, um, and in particular, we asked the speakers to reflect on three questions. What is actually new about citizenship revocation practices? Um, and if citizenship can be and is more easily revoked by state authorities, does this imply a new conditional form of membership? Secondly, how well can practices be compared between contexts? How do we ensure that international law obligations of states apply thirdly to all relevant situations in which states take or consider taking steps to deprive a person of citizenship as a national security measure? Now, what we're going to do today um, is address these questions in two sessions, each followed by a 20 minute Q&A session. So in the first session, we have Jasmine Burnley and Mohammed Al Ashmar, who address case studies of the Rohingya in Myanmar and the Kurds in Syria, respectively. And thirdly, Laura van Baas will provide a broader contextualization of what she calls a decade of denationalization. Then in the second session, we turn our attention mostly to the European context with Emeline Farks discussing developments in France and the UK and Joe Shaw, the role of international law, particular with attention to the Court of Justice of the EU and the Court of Human Rights. So in other words, we have a really um, a full agenda for uh, this uh, hour and a half, uh, making um, a small um, tour du monde, so to say. And for that reason, I ask everyone to, to, to stick to the eight minutes that are allotted to you. Uh, I apologize in advance for, for the need to be strict in keeping the time limits. Um, but we also very much invite the audience um, that is online to, to participate in this session. So when you are listening and when you have a question, uh, please use the Q&A function that you will see in Zoom and post your question. Uh, we should automatically see your name if that is registered to your Zoom account. And please indicate to whom you are asking your question. Um, and together with Jelena Jankits, who you also see on the screen, one of the uh, four co-directors of Global CIT, um, uh, she and I will moderate the debate. We will collect the questions and pose as many as possible um, questions to the speakers in these two Q&A uh, sessions. I see that Laura briefly disappeared, but we are hoping that she will be back uh, on time. Um, Without further ado, I suggest that I give the floor to the first speaker, Jasmine Burnley of the International Development Department, University of Birmingham. And Jasmine is also a former policy leader fellow at the School of Transnational Governance here at the EY. Jasmine, the floor is yours. 
Okay, thank you very much. Well, let me start by saying thank you for, for having me to speak today. And indeed, um, when I was invited to take part in this symposium, I, that was during my Policy Leaders Fellowship at um, EUI. So this is very much, my remarks come very much from a practitioner's point of view. Um, and drawing upon my own experiences and, and those of people that I worked with um, whilst I was in Myanmar. So I was in Myanmar for seven years and I worked on development and humanitarian issues with, with the range of different organisations. So, so those, the remarks I have are really coming from that perspective, as well as from the growing body of literature, which is now being written on um, citizenship in Myanmar and particularly citizenship for the Rohingya. So I think it's important to start by recalling that um, in August 2017, the world's attention was very clearly captured when over 700,000 Rohingya fleeing atrocities poured over the border from Myanmar into Bangladesh. Um, Cox's Bazaar camp in Bangladesh now hosts close to a million Rohingya refugees and it's widely recognised that the issues of systematic discrimination and uh, denial of citizenship have been intrinsically linked with the emergence of this refugee crisis. So thinking about it from the perspective of today's discussion point of citizenship revocation, um, as you've mentioned already, um, the rising use of citizenship revocation has been well documented. Thinking through the lens of the Rohingya case study, an important question to consider is whether we're seeing a widening in how citizenship revocation is constituted, what it means and what it looks like. So looking at the practice of citizenship in a number of countries, um, such as Australia and Canada and the UK, it seems to be often constituted an act, um, an act of revocation. When you look at the case study of the Rohingya, which I'll turn to in a minute in a bit more detail, you see that it's evolved more from a processual perspective. So um, it's evolved slowly over time through iterative steps, measures that are actually sometimes harder to see. So this is what I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about today. Um, when we uh, think about the condition of the Rohingya today, it's widely recognised as being one of chronic statelessness. And this hinges on a, on a number of factors. So the first, which many scholars have written about, is the privileging of um, a form of ethnic nationalism or um, ethnic nationalities, which has become in some forms sort of superior to citizenship as a concept itself. So over time, there has been a, this privileging of a, a recognised group of ethnic nationalities and membership of those groups is what determines membership of the political body of Myanmar. So we've seen a sort of um, a withdrawal of citizenship as the, the primary currency um, of the unit, a primary unit of belonging um, to the political body in Myanmar. The second thing has been legislative change. So in 1982, there was a citizenship, a citizenship law introduced which redefined what citizenship was considered to be and really enshrined these uh, belonging through an exclusive notion of ethnic nationalities. And it created tiers of citizenship, different classes of citizenship, which is one of the things that you've just mentioned as a key point on the agenda today. And as a result, the Rohingya were excluded from that. Um, and if they were not part of, if you were not part of one of those recognized official ethnic nationalities, or you didn't have proof documentary proof of your citizenship, then you were found yourself to be in a state of non-citizenship from that point on. Um, and then the third thing, which is a really driving factor of the, the statelessness of Rohingya people in Myanmar, is the practice of administrative measures. So uh, the use of measures to strip the Rohingya and other groups that fall into that category of their documentation, to pre which prevents them from claiming citizenship or, or even from the very basic uh, rights associated with citizenship, such as freedom of movement. Uh, there's also been the practice of failing to implement the citizenship law, which was put in place in 1982, because it does provide some routes to different forms, these different tiers of citizenship, but actually administrative measures have been taken to prevent or, or, or the, um, the following of that law, which has actually meant that possible routes of citizenship uh, for those people on the lower tiers haven't been pursued. So through the intersection of these different factors, the, the legislative change, administrative practices, and also a sort of strong, powerful narrative about what belonging to the national political body actually looks like, there's been a gradual revocation of citizenship for the Rohingya over a number of decades. And um, 
I mean, it's possible to see the revocation of the citizenship through particular events. For example, just to give a couple of examples, in the late 80s, in 1989, the uh, administration at the time put in place a new updated colour-coded system of identity documents. Um, the Rohingya were excluded from this and left with their existing documents. Well, those were out of date. So when later on a further documentation process was put in place, um, and those out-of-date documents for Rohingya became temporary identity cards, they were then left with temporary identity cards instead of official documentation that uh, defined their citizenship or classified them as citizens. And later on, this led to other acts, such as, for example, disenfranchisement ahead of the 2015 national uh, election in Myanmar. So you can see that a number of steps have been put in place, which have, through these different measures, revoked citizenship slowly and iteratively, but without a single act, without a single legislative act taking place. So this poses, I think, looking back on it myself, the question as to whether we need to be thinking of citizenship revocation differently as something which maybe is practiced by a wider range of nation states, um, perhaps which is harder to see because it's practiced in these uh, small steps using different tools and not through a single act of revocation. So I just, I'm sure I'm not sure how much time I've got left, but uh, just I wanted to raise one final point on one of the questions that is posed by today's programme that you've mentioned already, which is how to ensure international law obligations of states apply when they are taking steps to deprive a person or people of their citizenship. So through revoking the citizenship of its own people, of the Rohingya people, Myanmar is in contravention of its own obligations and those of international human rights law. But given the limits of going through international formal structures, uh, such as, for example, the UN Security Council and resolutions there, or the challenges of implementing responsibility to protect, whereby states are required to protect the people within their, their territories, um, given the challenges of, of going through these sort of structures, one question it would be interesting to discuss is whether there are ways that we can tackle the iterative erosions of citizenship, which can result in revocation without resorting to those international formal structures, to international law, because it is so difficult to work through those, those structures and, and through law. So, for example, can we, thinking from a practitioner's point of view, can we develop citizen uh, systems that flag erosion of citizenship towards revocation and statelessness and can actions in this area for example be linked to early warning signs of wider risks to the population such as the atrocities which you've seen committed in Myanmar so I have a cluster of, sort of questions around how we can think about that differently and what it means for practice as well as what it means for holding uh, states as actors to account and perhaps from a, a policy perspective uh, and for future research agendas there is work to be done on the ways in which a systematic denial of entitlements has the potential to be operationalized into citizenship revocation and all create the risk of wider uh, human rights violations. So that is something to think about in terms of how we can maybe track and monitor and understand how we see citizenship uh, revocation evolving over time rather than just as an act. So I will leave it there. Okay, many thanks, uh, Jasmine, for this very pertinent uh, intervention and also for problematizing this idea of revocation, which we often think about indeed as, a, as an act that we revoke, but it's actually something that is ongoing. Um, I think this brings up obviously many interesting and difficult questions. What does that mean for the study of citizenship deprivation or revocation? And indeed, you also pose the question, um, well, what does this mean for international protection? Um, just to reiterate also to our attendees that if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to post them already um, along the way. So we are keeping an eye on that. So once we start the Q&A, we will then um, go through the list of, um, of questions or select some if, if needed. Um, I'm happy to see that Laura seems to be back online. But first we give the floor to uh, Mohammed Al-Ashmar, uh, who is a researcher with the Middle East Directions uh, Program at the Robert Schumann Center at the EY. Um, here in Florence, and also as a researcher with the Syrian Center for Policy Studies. And Mohammed was also previously a policy leader fellow at the School of Transnational Governance at the EY. And the floor is yours, Mohammed.
Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, uh, my 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 session will be about maybe different thing. It's about uh, the Kurds of Syria and the Kurds of the Arab region, which was a problem and dilemma for many years in the region since decades. And uh, citizenship deprivation uh, and statelessness of Kurds in, in in the Arab region was a problem since decades, and the use of citizenship deprivation. Uh, uh, was one of the tools that used to to limit the power of the Kurds and to limit their aspiration their aspirations for autonomy. Um, uh, so as you as you may know, Kurds uh, are spreading uh, in in four different countries in Syria, Iraq, Turkey, and and Iran, and uh, and most of them are 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 spreading in the northeast areas of of Syria. Uh, and and they, they, the, the Syrian regime, uh, since the, pre the independence in, in, 19, uh, in 1945, the, the Kurdish uh, was always the, the, uh, the concerns for, 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 for this regime and the Syrian regime because of, of, the, um, uh, of the movements, the Kurdish movements for autonomy and uh, the aspirations for Kurdish states. So the citizenship revocation and, the, and, and uh, the deprivation of citizenship was used by the Syrian regime to limit this uh, power of, of, of the Kurdish, um, as, uh, especially because of the Parazani uprising in Iraq uh, that started in 1940. So the Syrian uh, uh, regime or the Syrian government started uh, different policies and different discrimination uh, approaches against 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 the Kurds, um, which is something uh, uh, different from other countries. For example, in 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 Iraq, the 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 Iraqi regime was very violent. Uh, for example, Saddam Hussein used the chemical weapon against the Kurds, while in Syria, the the Syrian regime used the citizenship deprivation as a tool uh, to limit uh, or let's say to to um, uh, uh, to to as a way to restrict their 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 ability, and the 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 uh, the most uh, uh, the first uh, the first uh, step of of of, uh, of this discrimination was the the Jazeera census of 1962, which was a decree uh, to to strip around 120,000 Syrian Kurds of of their citizenship. Uh, the justification from the Syrian regime uh, during this period was that most of them uh, came from Turkey and they are not Syrians and they are uh, aliens. So the government decided uh, to, to, to revoke uh, the, uh, the, the Syrian citizenship from around 120,000 Syrian Kurds. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this resulted that um, that most of, of, of these uh, uh, Kurds uh, classified in two, in two, in two categories, the, the Kurds uh, who are uh, uh, foreigners and they don't have any, any rights. Uh, they, have only, uh, uh, they have only a red card, which is not an identity card, it's just a card to say that they are foreigners of Al Jazeera and the others who, 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 did, who didn't part, participate in this census and they are categorized as uh, unregistered uh, uh, citizens. So they are undocumented uh, uh, Kurds. Um, uh, so this, uh, this practice or this degree was, was um, uh, as an approach by the Syrian regime to build the Arab belt the, the, uh, around the, uh, the Kurdish areas. And also it was a way for, 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 for them to, to, to dispose uh, the Kurds from their lands. So it was an approach, uh, or let's say it was a part of the Arab nationalist movements uh, uh, during this period. So what I'm trying to say that the citizenship revocation was uh, a practice by the government to control this area and to, and to deport the Kurds from the northeast of Syria. And uh, then they, uh, the Syrian regime started to, colonal, to colonize uh, this area and to give 
this lands to uh, to Arabs. Uh, this, as 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 I mentioned before, <coughs> all this discrimination and Arab Arabization uh, policies was um, because of the concerns from the Syrian regime, uh, because of the movements in Turkey and the revolutions in in Iraq uh, from the Kurdish movements. So the Syrian regime was trying to limit and restrict the ability of the Kurds in Syria and movement by denying them from any rights and denying them from citizenship. So, <clears throat> so this deprivation continued uh, uh, between 1970 and 2011, um, I mean till the Syrian uprising. So uh, the Syrian regime uh, continued depriving the Syrian, the, the Kurds from access, I mean the children of the Kurds, the, uh, denying them from, from getting uh, the, the Syrian citizenship. And, and denying them from any educational and health and culture and any access to public uh, services. Um, uh, then by, by, um, by, by 2000, um, then, then by 2004, uh, the protests started to grow in, the, uh, started in this area. Okay, uh, and then, uh, um, uh, different, I mean, the regime was very worried about this movement and this protest. So some facilitations and, and some exceptions uh, started to, to be given to some Kurdish, to some Kurdish families. Uh, and, and then by the Syrian up, uprising, uh, the, Syrian, the Syrian regime was also very worried about this movement and the growing and the escalation of the protest in the Kurdish areas. And, and, and then uh, they decided to give citizenship to all those who were a of the of their citizenship. And, and the Assad regime was hoping that by giving citizenship, it will give them an, uh, an opportunity to build good relation with the Kurdish areas and to, let's say, uh, to control uh, uh, this protest and, and, and uprising. But as you know, this has not happened. And then, um, also, the Syrian uprising was an, an opportunity for the Kurdish, uh, Syrian Kurdish, uh, for the Syrian Kurdish parties, which is now is, is supported by, by the autonomous ad administration, um, which is still, uh, which, which, which is now another problem, or um, which is uh, which, because of the autonomy administration now. Uh, there is still struggle uh, here. Uh, I think I have to um, to stop here. Um, the, the next speaker, I think, Dr. Laura, she did lots of uh, research about this area and is a great reference for this topic. So thank you very much. Okay, many thanks, uh, Mohammed. This is really excellent. Um, very much, um, I would say, well connected to the Jasmine's um, uh, talk, right, going into this idea of a replication, not so much being a single act, but rather a gradual process and also a crucial tool in, in political conflict um, of domination within a certain uh, territory. Um, and you've already set up the, um, the floor for Laura. We're happy that you're back online again, Laura. Um, so Laura van Waas is assistant professor at Tilburg University and founder and co-director of the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion. And we're delighted also to have you here today, Laura. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you also for the collaboration with this event. Uh, it's really exciting for us to be participating in a panel like this that is really trying to problematize the use of denationalization. Um, and I think it's important to start with the comment that when when this instrument is used it is by used by a government against its own citizens so it is an extreme form of power uh, a to allow a government to actually wield in the first place and b for a government to use carelessly um, and so i think that's an important preface to to some of the things that i would like to add to the discussion so far and I guess what I would like to do is zoom out a little bit from the two presentations that have looked at quite uh, specific contexts and really provided us with a rich understanding of what has happened in those in those particular settings. Um, and talk a little bit about the question of, 
Well, I guess one of the questions that was central to this webinar, what's new about this? Um, and as both of these presentations have shown us, well, there's nothing new about this. Um, and we could go further back into history and to the origins of the right to nationality even being recognised as a human right. And we could be talking about the Reich citizenship laws adopted by Nazi Germany in the 1930s, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that there is nothing new. Um, but at the same time, there is something very worrying about the here and now. And I think one of the ways in which uh, to talk about this is actually to, to first distract you with a few sentences about something else. Um, so every year, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, publishes annual global statistics on the state of displacement of, of refugees and asylum seekers globally. And this year, uh, as part of its Global Trends Report, it has also looked back on the last decade in order to comment on the state of displacement between 2010 and 2019. Um, and it uses quite uh, concerning terms. It talks about this as a decade of displacement. Uh, it notes that over 100 million people were forced to flee their homes during this period, and that only a small fraction of these have since been able to find a solution to their situation. Now, the reason I bring this up is that the UN Refugee Agency also publishes annual statistics on, on statelessness. Um, and this brings us closer to the, the topic of this webinar. And what's interesting is that in talking about a decade of displacement, the only reference made to statelessness is that in the same decade, 754,500 stateless people were able to confirm or acquire a nationality. Now this figure is interesting, but not really unless it's contextualized. That sounds as though we're making progress on issues around the right to nationality and recognition of citizenship. But in fact, we know that there are at least 15 million stateless people globally. So this is also a small fraction of people who have been able to find a solution. And what this number doesn't tell us is what the state of statelessness has been globally and the state of the right to nationality in this same decade of displacement. And unfortunately, if we're to look at this greater context, we could actually use the label decade of denationalization to talk about what we've seen over the last 10 years. And this has really been brought um, to its crescendo at the end of uh, this period in August 2019, with the publication of the new National Register of Citizens in Assam, India, where 1.9 million people were left off the list because they were unable to satisfy the requirements to establish their Indian citizenship and have been pushed to the brink of statelessness. Now they're still trying to resolve their situation by appealing to foreigners tribunals, um, but this has created a real citizenship crisis that has been aggravated further by the passing of a very contentious uh, Citizenship Amendment Act in India at the end of 2019, and is now being further aggravated by the effects of the COVID pandemic, in fact, which are making things incredibly complicated for people who have been affected by the NRC process both those who have got their names onto the list and of course those who are excluded from citizenship who are now unable to receive um, emergency relief and other forms of support from the government. So that's, that's a bad end to the decade of denationalization. Uh, we had a bad start in the sense that at the beginning of that decade we saw the independence of South Sudan and in the establishment of the new nationality rules in South Sudan and the change of rules in Sudan, uh, this also brought a huge risk of statelessness for a large number of people because the, there was not enough coordination between who was denationalized and who was offered citizenship in the new state. And we see a number of other markers across this decade. In fact, uh, tomorrow will mark seven years to the day that a constitutional court ruling in the Dominican Republic applied a very narrow understanding of who is a Dominican citizen by birth retroactively all the way back to 1929. So overnight, seven years ago tomorrow, uh, several tens of thousands of people were made stateless in their own country through an act of the, the highest court of the land. Um, now very much as we've heard for the Rohingya and for the Kurdish population, there is a lot that prefaced that. Uh, that is not the only act within the story of denationalization in the Dominican Republic. But that is what legally embedded um, their situation. 
and left many, many tens of thousands of people stateless. Um, and we've heard obviously about the Rohingya case um, in this same decade of denationalization. This is not when the Rohingya were stripped of their nationality, but we see a continued denial of citizenship and a worsening of their treatment um, all the way to what uh, many people warned and feared might happen uh, towards uh, the possibility of committing acts of genocide against this community. And I, I could go on with other examples, but I won't. What I think is important though to draw from this is that what is new uh, about revocation is I guess the pace at which this is happening but also the way in which governments that have for many decades shunned the use of this practice are also adopting it for their own means. Now, ostensibly, they're doing so in order to counter terrorism or protect national security. Ostensibly, they're doing so in order to target very specific individuals for their very particular behavior. But what we see is actually an erosion of the understanding of what citizenship is. Uh, these laws in, in the United Kingdom, here in the Netherlands, where I live, uh, and in, in the 15 other countries that have expanded their powers to deprive citizens of their nationality over the last decade, these create a problem for all of us, not just for the small number of people who may be affected by them. So to bring my contribution to a close, this understanding of the real uh, here and now of where we are on the issue is what led my organization, the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion, in collaboration with Open Society Justice Initiative and others, to launch a year of action against citizenship stripping this year. And the entire purpose of that is to put this issue back on the agenda and to start to really show that there are huge international law implications, there are huge, huge political and international relations implications of this, um, and we must really challenge the use of citizenship stripping and the rhetoric which comes with it around citizenship being a privilege, citizenship being contingent on a particular type of status or document or behavior. Um, and that's what I hope that this webinar will also contribute to. How do we identify strategies to turn a year of action from something which is just about visibility into something which starts to undermine these very dangerous uh, narratives um, and turn the tide on this policy. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Many thanks, uh, Laura. Um, also, uh, the, all three of you for sticking so um, very nicely to the time. So this means that we have um, still 20 minutes or so for Q and A, and um, I'm glad to see that um, a couple of the uh, people in the audience already. Uh, posted their questions. Um, we may not be able to, to address all questions uh, in the Q&A, but uh, rest assured that we're, we're collecting the questions and they will be also shared with the speakers who I think can also see them. Um, so your questions will, um, will reach the speakers one way or the other. Um, I'm going to read out uh, some of these questions or maybe the shorter versions of that. Um, and I think it's uh, very appropriate that we start with the first question by Rainer Baubock, um, uh, our um, co-director of uh, Global SIT, who has a question for Jasmine. Um, and I think that um, many of the questions to Jasmine, as I see it, also apply to, uh, to Mohammed and, of course, um, also in a more general sense to Laura's um, uh, contribution. And, and please feel free to uh, post your questions um, while, um, while we go. So. Um, um, two questions to Jasmine, uh, one by Rainer Baubock. Um, maybe we should not use the term revocation at all for cases like the Rohingya, where the problem is that their, uh, that their citizenship was never properly recognized and documented. It seems rather a case of denied access to citizenship. Um, um, then the second question to, uh, to Jasmine by Chun Luke from the Center for European Policy Studies. Um, given the challenges that you've highlighted in your presentation on the citizenship issues, of the Rohingya, what could be a feasible solution in your opinion for the Rohingya to have their or any citizenship recognized? Um, or would the alternative recognition as stateless persons be more preferable for them as a status rather than the limbo they are currently in? Well, that obviously is a very big question that relates to some uh, scholarly debate that is currently going on about whether sometimes statelessness may actually be preferable over an unclear uh, citizenship, but your thoughts on that, perhaps, uh, Jasmine. Um, and also two questions to uh, Mohammed. 
um, I'll give you all a couple of questions and then uh, give you the floor back. Um, a question from Thomas McGee. I would be interested to hear from Mohammed uh, to what extent he believes it is necessary to understand citizenship deprivation for Kurds in Syria within the context of a wider campaign of anti-Kurdish discrimination. Should we consider citizenship deprivation as simply one terrible element within a more comprehensive policy, including targeted land, property deprivations, prohibi prohibitions on language rights, etc.? Um, and the second question from Lillian Frost, which actually is to both uh, Jasmine and Mohammed. Uh, thank you for these interesting presentations in the Myanmar and Syria cases presented or the others mentioned when nationality revocations happened, whether in one act or over time, were these revocations legal? I think that also relates very much to the question of uh, what would be the international strategies uh, that, that Jasmine already mentioned. Um, in other words, did the revocation procedures follow those specified in the nationality law or its bylaws or published regulations or in related laws like those regulating identity cards? Um, two questions for Laura finally, and then I'll give the floor back to you. Um, a question from Maria Gerdes um, to Laura. Which international law conventions, regional public international law and international law are the most important ones who set borders for deprivation of citizenship, for example, when it comes to counterterrorism. That's a more general question. Um, and then a question from Abby Steele for Laura as well. I'm curious if citizenship replication relates or not to citizenship renunciation in your view. In particular, is there any relationship between states that increase ability to revoke and those that refuse to allow renunciation? Or do these follow different logics altogether? Okay, well, I think these are all excellent questions and it gives certainly our three speakers um, quite a bit to chew on. And um, while Mohammed and Laura are chewing, I give the floor first to Jasmine to briefly respond to it, take uh, maybe three, three minutes or so each. Yes, okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I see that the question from Babak has sort of disappeared. Um, so I'm trying to look for the detail of it again, but I mean, I guess the first thing to say was that um, I think, I mean, there are obviously different ways that citizenship revocation could be defined, but my understanding and that of, uh, certainly that of scholars that have written about this, as far as I know, is that uh, Rohingya at the time of independence in 1948 from the UK, from Britain, enjoyed the same rights um, as those others in the Myanmar political body. So whether it, it seems that there wasn't a consistent denial of citizenship from the beginning, and we could go into a lot of detail on this and I'm no expert, but that they did enjoy those rights at that time. Uh, and therefore it's not a question of a denial of citizenship later on, but actually a revocation of, of those rights because many of those Rohingya no longer have those rights, whether it's through being stripped of documentation or whether it is through the redefinition of citizenship in the law with those tiers of citizenship, which takes me to, again, I can't see a Baalbuck's full question at the beginning, but it does take me to another of the questions, which was from, um, I can't remember who it was from, but the, I'm struggling to see where all the questions have disappeared. Yeah, that was the question from uh, Chun Luke about the, the feasible solutions. Well, feasible solutions, um, I think that question was partly on the issue of whether there was some other sort of form of agreement that could be put in place that didn't recognize the, um, or didn't need citizenship to be attributed. I mean, it goes back to international law and responsibility to protect. States have that responsibility to ensure that people have a nationality they have a right to nationality and that goes back way back in terms of international law so i mean i think in practical terms uh, both the legislative change needs to happen so that citizenship is not tiered and it is full and that everybody including children born there in myanmar have have right to citizenship but also clearly there need to be a number of measures put in place to redefine um, and embrace a notion of belonging that applies to all of those people within its borders historically, and not just those groups that are defined by uh, a, a reduced list of ethnic nationalities. And I, as I said earlier, I made reference to the fact that 
it is largely the, the Rohingya that are the greatest, the most stateless um, community in Myanmar, but there are others as well about which less is known and less research has been done. But um, there, in terms of solutions, there needs to be both a redrafting of that law, there needs to be a new legislative framework put in place, but there also need to be actions, measures taken to ensure that the, the notion of belonging, of citizenship, is not just restricted to a very, you know, to the, not very reduced, but a reduced number of national ethnicities, which then exclusively pushes out those who don't fall under that group. Um, so I th think the answer lies there rather than in thinking of other things to solve problems of statelessness. It does, I think, come back to citizenship. So those are two of the questions and perhaps you could prompt me. Um, I'm looking through to see if there are any others directly. There were well, a few. There, there was a question from Lily, um, Jasmine, maybe briefly. It relates a bit to the last point so about um, whether these revocations were legal. And I think that also relates to the question of legal solutions or legal ways to address the problem so uh, sure and that's right thank you for um for pointing that to to me um so that's that's an interesting question because she asked in other words did the revocation procedures follow those specified in the nationality law and the answer i i think is is no in the sense that as i said earlier it wasn't just legislation that uh, was followed and thereby excluded people from citizenship that previously would have been entitled to it. It was also the fact that the legislation was not followed uh, and therefore possible routes to citizenship for people who had the lower tiers, so naturalized and associate rather than full citizenship, were also not followed. And again, scholars have written about this as well. But the, the real issue with this is that it's very great and it's, it's very difficult to see what measures are being taken. And if it's this mix of legislative, narrative and administrative practices, that are leading to concrete restrictions on people's um, uh, rights associated with citizenship, whether it's access to services or just movement between villages, or whether it's actually stripping them of citizenship entirely by effectively revoking it. It's very difficult to track and monitor and see that in, in process if, it, if there isn't an, a distinct act involved. And I think that's what makes these cases, some of which Laura's mentioned, Mohammed as well, much more difficult to engage with and track and understand and act upon because it's very very great. Okay thanks Jasmine. Uh, Mohammed. there were a couple of questions to you about contextualization of the, yeah, the situation of the Kurds in, in Syria. Um, yeah thank you. Your thoughts? Yeah um, yes I just want to say um, yes it was part of, of, the, of the wider campaign. Uh, this campaign started maybe 80 years ago or, or 70 years ago against Turkish and the discrimination or, or sorry the citizenship repropriation was part of or let's say the biggest part of this policy in Syria uh, against the Kurds. In other countries in Iraq as I mentioned the Dahatan used the chemical weapon in Turkey they displaced the, uh, the Kurds from their lands and they, and they deported them from their houses and lands and in Syria, this in 1970, 1980s, and uh, during 2004, 5, 6, this deprivation and this uh, denial of rights continued and still continuing. So yes, it, it, it was very terrible, uh, a terrible uh, element of the wider or comprehensive uh, uh, policy against the Kurds, against the Kurds in, of, of Syria, Kurds of Iraq, Kurds of, of of, 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 of Turkey. So yes, unfortunately, that's, I mean, a very long discussion about um, the autonomy of the, of the Kurdish state. Uh, and this, uh, um, unfortunately, un unfortunately, will continue uh, 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 now as we see Turkey and Erdogan are still targeting the Kurdish villages in, in Syria mm -hmm. and still killing them. And uh, during the Syrian uprising, the, uh, the Assad regime arrested many, uh, many, and still arresting many Kurdish activists, and uh, still um, the discrimination still continuing. So I mean, I can't say only yes. It 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 was the most terrible demographic change and demographic violence I think in the history of this world. Okay, thank you, Mohammed. Um, would you like to say something about the um, so? Obviously, I think your 
yeah, your story is that this is a extremely political, right? So the political context and the geopolitical context matters a lot. Um, so to come back to Lily's question, Lillian's question, to what extent um, is there any uh, meaningful discussion to be had in the, um, the legality of the, uh, the nationality revocation um, or, yeah, in fact, um, in the, I think in the, the uh, 1962 census that you mentioned, right, where, where there is a de facto exclusion. So is there any meaningful legal discussion about this or is it all politics? Uh, yeah, it's it's the politics, but also when we are talking about the authoritarian regime, like the Assad regime, Iraqi regime, Turkey regime, it's not like I mean there is not no yeah it was it was a decree in 1962, but it was a campaign and um, uh, uh, it was it, it was um, legal, legalized for within Syria, but I mean. For Kurds, it was a violence. It's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a process of of of, of uh, discrimination. Maybe I have to 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 read the question again. Is that Martin uh, exactly what what he mean by legalization? I think so. I'm, I mean, I, I mean, when I, when we talk about the Syrian regime, the Assad regime, who are I mean, you know about that. I think everyone, it's it's a authoritarian approach that. Um, this, uh, that discrimination was on Palestinian refugees. Uh, they didn't get any any also citizenship. So, I mean, many of them. So it's not it it's not just about the the, the Kurds. Sometimes it, it it was about discrimination against all the minorities and people who or let's say the groups that might uh, um, that that have their, that might uh, make a risk on on this political regime. Okay, thank you, Mohammed, and I'm glad to give the floor now to Laura, who, who maybe can also give some further insights on the international legal context. Uh, Joe will also come back to that, of course, in the, uh, the second part of the session. But your thoughts on some of these issues raised, Laura? Sure, yeah. Um, a lot of really interesting questions. I can see more coming in as well. So I'll try and cover as many as I can in a very short time. Um, on the international legal context, what astounds me and depresses me most, actually, is in uh, speaking to security experts from Western states about the use of citizenship stripping, which is kind of new and exciting to them. And they don't really understand it. Uh, they don't understand that it's permanent, whereas a lot of counterterrorism measures, they have sunset clauses, they have monitoring and evaluation systems, and they're in place temporarily, and then you have to show an ongoing risk. And so what's really interesting, I think, is that the both the specificity of the use of this measure as compared to others for national security reasons, but also the, the very specific international law framework that um, prevents states from using denationalization willy-nilly um, are not very well known. And so there are, there are very clear and strong human rights obligations, um, including the prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of nationality, which was already laid down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and for which there is also some really exciting emerging jurisprudence, at least in other parts of the world, in Europe so far, as I think we'll hear from Joe in a moment, it's a little bit more hesitant. Uh, but there are clear international standards um, and these standards go beyond prohibiting statelessness, which is often what those who know something about this issue will say, OK, yes, but we're not using it to create statelessness. Um, but that's not the only international norm and arguably not even the most important one, uh, because often when statelessness isn't created, it's still severing a person's main identity, um, the main centre of their rights. Uh, and it often is used in quite discriminatory ways. So in terms of the international framework, there is a lot to say about it. Um, ISI and a number of other organizations uh, uh, embarked on a kind of a consultation process over the last three years to develop a set of principles that provide clear guidance on what the international norms actually contain. So if you're interested in understanding more about that, the principles on deprivation of nationality as a national security measure have been published earlier this year, together with a really extensive commentary about where these principles are derived from, what norms and what jurisprudence. Um, they can be found also in this publication, which is our uh, 2020 World Stateless Report, which is on deprivation of nationality. 
that also contains essays from people working within different disciplines. I saw that someone has asked a question about the psychological consequences. Um, there is not a lot of research on this, but there's a really interesting essay in this World Stateless Report from uh, psychologists who were specialized in the study of ostracism. Um, and they speak about the very far reaching implications of this very um, definitive form of exclusion from society. So it makes a really good read. Uh, and then I just wanted to comment on two of the other things very briefly. Um, the question on whether revocation and renunciation kind of go hand in hand. Um, not that I'm aware of. Those states that have expanded their powers to deprive nationality uh, are not necessarily the states that have the most interesting renunciation provisions. Um, but it would be interesting for someone to track that more closely, I think. Um, there was also a question around uh, the misuse of this and the misuse of the war on terror. One thing I, I had meant to say in my presentation earlier was in addition to all of the other things that mark the decade of denationalization, there's also a huge upsurge in the use of this against human rights defenders, political opponents and journalists. Uh, not only in Bahrain, where there have been an extremely high number of cases, several hundred since 2011, but also, for instance, in the post-coup environment in Turkey uh, against journalists in Azerbaijan, political opponents in various countries in Africa. Uh, so, yes, this, this is kind of rolling over in lots of different ways in countries around the world. And often what is invoked is the national security argument. Uh, also where people are actually exercising very clearly certain fundamental freedoms. Um, so there too, there's, there's something to be concerned about. Okay, many thanks, Laura. And um, to all three of the speakers from the first session. Um, well, there are really a lot of um, topics that we could pick on uh, defining revocation, uh, the historical process of it, the international legal context of it. Um, We'll have to stop it for here with the first uh, session. Um, many thanks also to the, um, the first part of the, uh, the session. Many thanks also to the, uh, the audience for leaving the questions. We hope to, to have picked up um, as many as possible. I think we did touch on many of these uh, questions. Um, and do um, keep on posting your um, questions while we move to the second part of the uh, session. So thanks again to uh, Jasmine, Mohammed, and Laura. And we now um, zoom in a little bit, uh, you could say, to the European context, but I think both Emilienne and Joe might, might make more general uh, reflections on, on what is uh, specific about the European context. Um, and I give the floor first to uh, Emilienne Park, who is a Max Weber Fellow at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies here at the European University Institute. Um, Emilienne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. So uh, I'll share my screen because I actually have a PowerPoint presentation. So, um, yes. Um. All right, do you see now the, the PowerPoint or? No, we, we uh, just saw it, but now it disappeared. So you need to okay. share again. How about now? Not yet. So you originally, okay. we, originally we could see it when you shared it, but then you pushed yes. the wrong button. Okay. Okay. Maybe you could make the screen larger by... by yes. Um... Sorry, that is getting a little bit longer than I expected. If you have an F5 on your keyboard, you might press that. Yes. Okay, fine. Um, so yeah, so uh, before we, we start, sorry, I'd like to, uh, to thank the two organizers of uh, this webinar. Uh, Martin Vink and uh, Jelena Jankic for, for the invitation. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be part of uh, this event and to, to listen to, to presentations that for, for some of them, uh, Isolt, Onohan uh, and I 
have had the opportunity to to read and and to comment uh, as part of a, a project of symposium on citizenship revocation that we are coordinating together and which we hope to to publish uh, on the global sit website most likely in 2021 um, so as we've seen uh, with the, the previous presentations uh, many states have turned to citizenship revocation to uh, well struggle against uh, terrorist threats uh either on their own territories or abroad um and this mode of citizenship revocation has received much uh public attention um either from the media or from scholars and compared to uh, this mode of citizenship stripping fraud induced citizenship revocation has received relatively less uh, attention in scholarship so when uh, fraud-based citizenship stripping is mentioned, it's usually considered as a very thin mode uh, of loss of citizenship. Um, citizenship stripping in cases uh, of fraud would merely um, deprive people who, who, merely who merely apply to people who haven't respected uh, the rules of, uh, of naturalization. And uh, this actually uh, connects with uh, the idea that um, citizenship um, revocation or citizenship policies would only have to do with uh, thin uh, and uh, procedural norms in this, um, um, let's say, um, I'm sorry, but I think I'll have to, to stop the PowerPoint because I cannot read my notes. Um, so uh, I will just um, stop sharing my, my screen. Um, sorry about that. No problem. So, um, yes, I was just uh, saying that dep deprivation based on fraud when it is mentioned in, scho in scholarship is purely seen uh, as a means to guarantee the consistency of the naturalization process against applicants who do not respect the rules of naturalization. And this tends to reinforce the idea uh, that the line between desirable and undesirable citizens is drawn in accordance with thin and procedural norms, to put it in Christian Yopke's words, which supports the general thesis of a lightening or a thinning of citizenship. So in contrast, in this presentation, which is based on an article that I recently published in the journal Citizenship Studies, I will argue that deprivation on grounds of fraud aims to create virtuous and responsible political subject. Drawing on the cases of France and the UK, I will show how government officials and judges understand citizenship deprivation not simply as a means to safeguard the procedural integrity of naturalization, but as a mechanism for the moralization and responsabilization of applicants. I've decided to compare France and the UK since the research that's been recently conducted on these two countries has suggested a, co a convergence between the British and French citizenship regimes along similar neoliberal and communitarian lines in particular following the introduction of integration contracts or integration tests. Though fraud has been a key concern of the British and French governments in citizenship and migration policies in recent years, its relevance for testing the convergence of governing strategies in the two countries hadn't yet, had not yet been investigated, and this is what I've tried to do uh, in this paper. So I focus on the underlying bureaucratic practices for fraud-based citizenship deprivation because this makes it possible to assess the impact of governmental rhetoric related to integration and naturalization on the way bureaucratic institutions uh, negotiate national boundaries and justify citizenship stripping. In the first part of my paper, I come back on the importance that successive British and French governments have attached to the struggle against fraud in migration and citizenship policies over the last 30 years, 
but I don't want to go into too much detail uh, on this part. Suffice it to say here that in the two countries, I find the same securitized approach to fraud with this idea that is becoming more and more emphasized by government uh, offic officials that suspected fraudsters should be more strictly controlled and uh, if they are found guilty, they should be sanctioned. So in the second part of my paper, I examine how officials and judges understand fraud-based citizenship deprivation to identify what exactly um, is or what exactly are the, the political implications of this securitized approach to fraud. Although citizenship deprivation on grounds of fraud is not subject to the same degree of judicial review in France and the UK, and I can come back on this point in the, in the discussion, it is understood as a tool for identifying potential cheaters in both France and the UK. Rather than being merely a legal issue, the uncovering of fraud is invested with moral meaning in the two cases. This is evident in relevant case law, as well as in the statements of the officials in charge of deprivation. The French officials I interviewed referred to the individuals they deprived of citizenship as, I quote, dissemblers, and presented the purpose of their work as deterring people from, I quote, lying, dissimulating, or misbehaving. In fact, they suggested that by maintaining the procedural integrity of the naturalization process, they were also protecting uh, its moral value. In, in the UK- a minute, maybe, Emilien, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Um, so in the UK, cheating and lying were similarly presented as wrong for threatening the very purpose of naturalization, namely to celebrate citizenship as a high standard or a very important step that only those who are worthy deserve to take as uh, the responsible of the deprivation unit at the Home Office uh, told me. Um, so yes, uh, to conclude, I find some uh, important divergences uh, between France and the UK. Uh, first of all, French courts are more able to control the decisions from the Ministry of the Interior uh, compared to the British counterparts, especially on the question of the prevention of statelessness, and this is something uh, that we can further discuss. I also find that uh, the British and the French executives are not pursuing the same objectives with citizenship deprivation because removal is often the objective in the UK and it's not the case in France. Uh, but in both countries, citizenship deprivation is conceived by those who put it into practice as a mechanism for the moralization and responsabilization of naturalization applicants. And citizenship is not being reduced to thin and procedural forms to come back to, to, Jopke's, to Jopke's quote. It is linked to a thick vision of national membership, uh, which sees the citizen as an individual that should be committed to the common good rather than simply being uh, lower binding. Thank you for your attention and, and sorry for, uh, for the poor point. <laughs> Okay, many thanks, Emilian, for, for opening up this, um, what is other discussion on citizenship revocation and looking at this from oh, a perspective that has been especially a very um, um, uh, current in European debate. So this, um, not just the, the counter-terrorism, but also the fraud-based um, uh, rev revocation or deprivation of citizenship and uh, linking that to this bigger question of whether this reflects actually as a, thinning, a thinning of citizenship or rather a thickening of citizenship. Um, so those of you in the audience, if you have any questions or, or thoughts on that, please uh, share them in the Q&A. Um, I give now the floor to Joe Shaw, who uh, holds the Salveson Chair of European Institutions at Edinburgh University and is also a professor at, new, at the new social research program of Tampere University in Finland. And of course, most important, she is also one of our four uh, co-directors of the Global Citizenship Observatory. Joe, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just sharing my screen. I hope it's working. Is that, is that working? Yeah, that's working fine. Thanks, Joe. Good, good. So um, hopefully you, you're not going to be disturbed by my um, 
by any notes or anything like that. So I'm, I've, um, thank you very much, um, uh, Martin and Yelena, for organizing this and for, uh, to the Robert Schumann Center for hosting it. This is my first time uh, speaking within the framework of, of the um, uh, Zoom webinar function. So if I make a mistake, then please don't be too harsh on me. Um, I've stupidly got um, 10 slides and eight minutes. So that's gonna be fairly, um, fairly swift, isn't it? Um, so uh, I, my, I've, I've simplified my, um, my title slightly, The International and Constitutional Dimensions of Loss of Citizenship, A Tale of Two Courts. And I'm gonna focus um, on the European uh, Court of Human Rights and on the, um, uh, great, so that doesn't, my key, keyboard pad doesn't seem to want to, um, doesn't seem to want to advance my slides. Any suggestions on that yeah, one? I think in your bottom corner on the left, there is a little arrow, right? Ah. Yeah. Oh. Gosh, yes. There's no little arrow, but there's a lot of advancing. Um, none of that is any good. Nope, that's... Uh, sorry, we have to start again. Um, okay. Uh, yep, we're all right now. So... Um, uh, so what I want to emphasize in my brief discussion is that loss of citizenship is both a political and a constitutional issue. And um, my focus uh, in recent uh, months and years has, been, it has partly been on the, the national level and the, the constitutional constraints. And people often sort of point to the cases of Germany and the US as, place, as, as countries where there are constitutional constraints upon uh, revocation of citizenship. But uh, um, I'm more than happy to discuss in Q&A why those cases may not provide the evidence they're sometimes thought to do. Furthermore, it, it isn't only a political question, and I'll return to this at, at the end as well, um, but um, there are... Um, uh, also been restraints and hesitations though in some countries, e.g. in, uh, in Canada. Uh, so the, um, the question, I think, from a political perspective, and this is an essential, to my mind, an essential, essential introduction to, to thinking about um, uh, the, the whole question from, from the perspective of, um, uh, the, the whole perspective of, um, uh, uh, courts is to think about whether or not uh, the, the most appropriate uh, parties to determine these questions, perhaps in the context of um, what one might characterize as more, more, more uh, countries that are more like liberal democracies. I'm not terribly sure whether there are any liberal democracies left in the world now, um, but countries that are more like liberal democracies, what is the proper role of legislatures and courts um, at the national level in the context of the anti-revocation, uh, the, the revocation of citizenship. Anti-terrorism strategies um, have to be uh, viewed within the context of the rise of populism within many governments and legislatures and the development of what um, a, a law colleague, Nikki Lacey, calls legislative populism, which may be slightly different to uh, governmental populism and conflicts with, with liberal norms, but these are potentially popular as well as in a way, um, in many respects, being populist in terms of how they segment, if you will, the concept of the people. But my uh, specific uh, brief for, for here was to, to consider a little bit about the role of international law and supranational law limited, um, and it's limited as the necessarily necessary corollary to the proposition that matters of acquisition and loss of citizenship are issues of national sovereignty. And what you do find in the two courts that I'm going to look at is a good deal of deference um, on the part of those international courts and authorities to states in relation to matters of national security and terrorism. So briefly, I'm going to consider uh, two courts in, in the remaining sort of five, quest uh, five minutes or so, um, and uh, look briefly at the, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights in relation to the sorts of questions that we've been looking at today. And I'm lucky to be going last because pretty much all of the, uh, the issues have been introdu introduced either um, uh, by the speakers or by the very, very uh, intelligent questions that we've been receiving. 
So the cause of justice uh, of the EU deals occasionally with issues of citizenship loss. Um, and this is a somewhat um, uh, a counter, uh, a counterfactual. It's unexpected in a way. It would have been unexpected at an earlier stage in the sense that um, EU law doesn't regulate national law, uh, national citizenship law. But two very, very well-known cases have come up where the Court of Justice has uh, determined that um, although uh, member states are free to determine citizenship, law in accordance with their national provisions. They have to do so in a way that has regard to the requirements of EU law. Now, neither Rotman, which was concerned with a man who, uh, a fraudulent nationality case, and Tebes, which was concerned with loss of citizenship um, by lapse of time, if you will, uh, for those outside the European Union under Dutch law. Neither case uh, de deals with national security issues and national courts have not shown any inclination to use the EU argument of loss of substance of EU citizenship and to make a, a reference to the, the Court of Justice on this matter. So we don't yet know what the Court of Justice would do if it were faced with such a question. But what we can do is to sort of extrapolate, if you will, from, the, from its existing approach. It recognizes the discretion of member states in relation to national citizenship. It requires that national law must be applied in such a way as to have regard to the requirements of EU law, so as not to deprive an EU citizen of the substance of their EU citizenship. And that's, as it were, um, quoting the test. Uh, it requires an individual assessment, an individualized assessment, and it requires the application of a proportionality test. And from time to time, it makes comments itself as to what represents a proportional approach on the part of um, a state to, to loss of citizenship. Um, it has perhaps imposed some constraints on member states, but as I say, we can't necessarily extrapolate from what it's done as to what it would do if it were faced with a case of um, uh, 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 nas uh, and, and, and a case re uh, relating to national security and anti-terrorism and anti-radicalization -radical measures. The Court of Human Rights, however, has uh, been faced directly with this question. Um, uh, it, more of its examples of case law, and it's now quite a vast case law, so in the remaining three minutes I can barely do justice to it, um, there, more of its case law is concerned with aspects of denial of citizenship rather than loss of citizenship or statelessness. Um, and it, it, it works against the absence of a specific guarantee of the right to citizenship in the ECHR. And in this respect, one can compare the European Convention on Nationality and the U U uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. On the issue of, uh, of revocation of citizenship, withdrawal of citizenship for reasons of national security, um, we need to point to a couple of recent cases, Goumid and France, which was noted on Global Set by our colleague Jules Lepoutre, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, it builds on a case that came from the, uh, the, out of the UK, dealing with the UK's approach, um, looking at Article 8 of uh, the, the, the Convention, which is concerned with private life. Goumid also raised private life issues and also Article 4 of the Protocol number seven and in neither case was the court place, placing any constraints on what the um the member states uh, sorry on what the contracting parties were doing um it didn't find a disproportionate um uh interference with private life and it didn't find in the case of gumid and um uh, that this was a double punishment although that that uh, cr uh, that conclusion has been quite substantially uh criticized uh, we can anticipate that the UK's Shamima Begum pet case may eventually end up in the Court of Human Rights and might provide a different take on the issue of private life, given the circumstances of her, um, her um, case where she was, or she was a minor when she originally went to Syria and so on. This is quite a well-known case. Um, the characteristics of the approach, again, um, are that the cases have to relate to one or other of the rights under the convention, fair trial, never succeeded, private life hasn't succeeded in these cases, or double punishment also hasn't succeeded, perhaps to the surprise of commentators. The questions that arise are, is it in accordance with the law? Is it proportionate? Is it arbitrary? 
And there has been a, a really generally deferential approach to assessing state action in relation to these matters of terrorism, radicalization, emergency, perhaps far too deferential. Um, our court colleague Jules Lepoutre on the Global SIP blog argued that the European Court of Human Rights has created a grey hole in relation to these matters. So just briefly to, to conclude, um, this, there are similarities of approach between the two courts, although the legal structure within which they're working differs sharp, sharply. The Court of Justice is, con is concerned with questions as to whether or not national citizenship law is applied in such a way as to um, empty the substance of EU citizenship, um, uh, the, 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 the figure of EU citizenship of its substance, for example, in relation to losing, losing EU citizenship, so you lose, lose free movement rights, or you might have to leave the territory of the Union. Um, in the Court of Human Rights, it is a, a human rights assessment which uh, can only be embarked upon once you've exhausted national remedies. Um, but there is in both cases a, dem a, a deference to national democratic choices, one could say, although some of us in this, in this room, in inverted commas, wouldn't necessarily agree with those choices. Both courts have taken, I think, quite a substantive view of what citizenship is in the context of loss. There are in the relevant cases quite a lot of references to issues of allegiance. But I would question whether either court has fully confronted the complexities of the rise of dual citizenship, and in particular, the issue of the relationship to access to naturalization. And Milena Tripkovich raised that in the questions, I think, towards the end of the last session and the implications of all of this for issues of deprivation. So I'll uh, conclude there, hoping to have kept the time. Okay, excellent. Many thanks, uh, Joe, for outlining the, um, well, the, the large context of uh, the various legal systems in, uh, in, in Europe and these uh, two particular courts. Um, so we have um, 15 minutes left for, for Q&A. Um, and um, thanks to uh, some of you who have already left some uh, questions in the Q&A section. So I'm going to um, read out a couple and first uh, some questions for um, Emilien. Um, so a question by uh, Lillian Frost. Um, thanks for your presentation. Is there um, in France, uh, in the UK and France, a racialized or, or gender dimension to the citizenship replications um, that you review? Uh, where certain groups are targeted with the enforcement of these fraud provisions disproportionately more than other groups. Um, and also a question from Francisca Meyer. Question to Emilien, very interesting. Do you have an insight into whether this perception of public officials that the revocation policies make citizenship more valuable and uphold standards also reflects in public opinion? I feel like they are relatively broadly discussed in the counter-terrorism context are they also broadly discussed with the fraud context? Maybe I would add um, a question by myself, Emilien. Um, so I see to some extent where you're going with the idea that this reflects a thickening of citizenship. We try to put a lot of things in there. Um, at the same time, I find it also a bit counterintuitive. So maybe the counter argument to this would be that these um, uh, fraudulent acquisition dep uh, revocation decisions, they are often issued is my understanding, at least in the Dutch context, which I know better, in a rather technical matter. So disregarding any substantive links that an individual might have with the communities of people who have actually lived for a very long time on the territory, just because of some technicality in the name or in the procedure. And from that perspective, I would, I would argue that this um, um, proliferation of fraud-based revocation rather reflects a, a thinning uh, as opposed to a thickening of, of citizenship. Um, well, then we have a question from uh, Mira that is addressed to Emilienne. Actually, I think to some extent, Joe may be also um, very uh, well placed to, to, um, uh, to answer this. So there has been, because uh, Mira Seifetinoglu uh, re refers to the uh, GOMIT uh, decision that Joe um, discussed, uh, where five dual nationals had been deprived of their French citizenship in 2015. They were first sentenced to six to eight year prison terms and then deprived of their French citizenship, but the ECHR denied violation of respect for private and family life and the right not to be punished twice. Um, Joe, of course, you, re you refer to the, to the deference to state um, 
privilege and, and Mira's question would be to, uh, to Joe and also to Emily and of course if he wants to pick this up where do you see the role of the ECHR vis-a-vis -vis citizenship verification um, and a question from Maria Gerdes uh, to Joe Shaw the European Convention on Nationality from 1997 allows in its article 7d the deprivation of citizenship if a conduct is seriously prejudicial to the vital interests of the state some states, for example, Germany, argue that the deprivation of terrorists, and they refer to ISIS fighters with double citizenship who fight abroad for a terrorist organization. Um, so uh, it's in accordance with this article. And, and Maria wonders to what extent this is true and whether you might have any thoughts on this. Um, and maybe um, thirdly also a, um, a question by Rachel Pounier. Uh, to Joe Shaw, does the fact that both courts, the uh, Court of Justice of the EU and the European Court of Human Rights, defer to national states despite having seemingly substantive approaches to citizenship suggest the inadequacy of proportionality as an adjudicatory approach? Um, so again, quite a bit um, to chew on maybe for both of you. And uh, I would like to give the floor first to Emilien uh, for a couple of minutes to answer some of these questions. Well, thank you, thank you all for for all these uh, all these questions. So uh, to start with uh, Lillian Frost's question on the racialized or gendered dimension of citizenship allocations in uh, the UK and France. Um, so on the racialized dimension, I actually find that uh, in France there there are some uh, ethnocultural stereotypes behind uh, fraud-based citizenship stripping um, because. The, must, the, the vast majority of fraud-based uh, deprivations in France involve people who failed to, to mention the name of a spouse or a child living abroad in their naturalization application and who apply for family reuni reunification afterwards. Um, and actually, fraud-based citizenship deprivation in France is part of a, of a system of control over civil status documents that can also be found that can also be found at the naturalization stage and uh, that is directed against the figure of the the family migrant and, and this figure of the family migrant is commonly associated with african migrants uh, in france who are seen as posing a risk of mass migration due to them allegedly having uh, larger families and so such stereotypes find echoes uh, in the, the explanations that officials and judges give about the targets of, uh, of fraud-based uh, deprivation. Uh, in the UK, I also, uh, well, a large number of cases involve former uh, asylum seekers uh, who pretend to be Kosovars, uh, well, Albanian citizens who pretend to be, to be Kosovars, um, so fraud also tends to be seen as a problem that is posed by a specific category of, of migrants, but it's the stereotyping, well, that there is no ethnocultural uh, stereotype uh, in the case of, uh, of the UK. Um, on the gender dimension, I've actually tried to, to, to access data on, uh, well, let's say the distribution of uh, citizenship deprivation des decisions based on, uh, on sex. But I, I haven't been uh, I haven't been able to to get access to this data. So unfortunately, I, I, I don't have any any idea of of what might be this gender dimension. Um, moving on to the to the next question. So about uh, the perception. Um, yes. Uh, how how does this translate into uh, in public opinion? Uh, I think that contrary to, to citizenship uh, deprivation on, on terrorism grounds, fraud-based citizenship deprivations uh, attract much less public attention. So uh, I don't have any, any idea of, uh, of what might be the, 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 pub, what the public opinion might think of, uh, over, over these issues. I think that there is an interesting case in, in Canada where there was a public debate at the beginning of uh, uh, I think it was in 2012, where many cases of uh, fraud-based uh, citizenship uh, stripping deci decisions were taken. So it might be interesting to, to have a look at, uh, well, 
what we, what was the the what we're Paul saying at the time in uh, in Canada on this uh, on this issue. And uh, finally, I think yes. So there was a, a last question. No, there was a question from uh, from Martin about thinning. Um, yes, about the idea that citizenship deprivation is uh, in the end a technical issue, and that this might uh, rather um, well um, show a thinning of of, of of citizenship rather than a thickening. So actually, it's true that uh, when I interviewed the, the the people who are responsible for citizenship deprivation, they they were uh, having a very technical approach to to uh, to the process. But uh, what was interesting is that uh, when they tried to well, when they when they justified their own practices, they were turning to let's say a thicker conceptions of citizenship and the way they were uh, talking about. The people there they targeted in their decisions uh, were well very moralizing and uh, yes there was this idea that citizenship is more than just uh, complying with the rules of the host of the whole society but that you should also uh, adhere to to the common values uh, and so on and so forth so yes I think I'll leave it there uh, and uh, give the floor to uh, to Joe Thanks a lot, Emilia and Joe. Oh, just unmute yourself. Sorry, I keep yeah. forgetting to do that. So I, 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 I count sort of three, three questions which are um, holding us um, back from our dinner. So I'll deal with them as quickly as I can. Um, the, the question from Myra um, was indeed more, much more aimed towards me than towards um, uh, towards Emilian, maybe maybe I answered the question that you asked Myra in the context of um, my presentation. I'm looking at the timing. Maybe I hadn't started talking about Gumid. I think it's a very worrying case in terms of deference to um, to to the uh, to, to the court. Not so much on the issue of private life, um, although the the delay, but because of the, the, the refusal to accept the argument. Um, that this represents a double penalty when it's when it it was explicitly imposed for political reasons shortly after the um, the shootings the um, the Charlie Hebdo shootings wasn't it I think yes so um, this, these points are well discussed in in um, uh, Jules' very uh, critical um, uh, discussion of it and I I think there's another there's another um, there's another blog on it as well somewhere else. On the interwebs, um, I absolutely agree with that. Um, the question uh, from Maria Gerdes concerns the European Convention on Nationality, and of course, yes, the Convention on Nationality does allow for states to have certain um, certain space. I mean, the Convention on Nationality simply sort of um, sets out, if you will, um, the uh, what one might regard as a sort of a code of code of best practice and uh, citizenship. Lots of re 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 removal of citizenship um, uh, is 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 a is a well established practice. But as as is pointed out, then the 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 types of arguments that are being made around it are changing over time. That's unsurprising. And in the context of um, many cases now, not just in Germany but also in in Denmark and, and Norway, when when they um, allowed dual citizenship in the last 10 years was specifically um, to, to allow the removal of citizenship without, um, without breaching norms of statelessness. And I think that there's some, some tension between the different types of norms that are in play here um, in terms of the development of a norm of dual citizenship and the, um, the, 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 the resistance to um, uh, breaching the norm of, of, of statelessness, uh, but at the same time, coming back to the point that Martin asked Emilia, whether that represents then a, a thinning of, of citizenship in the sense of, of a more instrumental perspective being taken both by 
states and also potentially by citizens in terms of their accumulation of different statuses actually rendering their citizenships more conditional and that that can work that in a sense works but then it can it can not work in a rather spectacular way when you have the uk making assumptions about shamima begum being a bangladeshi citizen no she's not um, uh, says says bangladesh yes she is says the uk and uh, likewise, uh, another uh, man who was, who's fallen foul of these systems, who's currently in, in prison in the US, um, Pham, who um, uh, uh, some say he's Vietnamese, some of the British courts have said he's Vietnamese, British government says he's Vietnamese. Um, most people would argue it's almost impossible for him to access Vietnamese citizenship. And, and so in a sense, you sort of see uh, you see that, that one of the things that's happening here is that states are able to outsource their responsibilities. And uh, the question is whether or not um, it's the role of courts such as the European Court of Human Rights or the uh, political institutions of the ECM, because it doesn't have a court, um, uh, uh, will, will, um, will have... Um, you know what what types of responsibilities do they have in this context or are the solutions to this actually more in the political realm as as they were in canada where um uh justine uh, trudeau made it a, a a plank of his election campaign the first time not in the recent election which was a bit uh, different but in the first election campaign it was he made it a plank of his election campaign to say there are no conditional um, Canadian citizens we are all equal and those are I think very important um, uh, norms right so on Rachel Pugne who's written an entire PhD thesis on loss of citizenship so I feel more than slightly um, uh, 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 sort of um, uh, challenge by answering this question. I don't have any. I'm not. A, I'm not an administrative lawyer. So, and I'm not. I'm not even like a constitutional courts lawyer. So, I don't have any strong views about proportionality as an adjudicatory approach. I tend to. I tend to think that it. It is as it were. It is what it is. It's. It's. It's uh, a, a norm that uh, that can be used for deference, but it can also be used in a way by courts to to be quite engaged with. Um, questions of, of individual remedies and the individualized assessment. So I, I don't have any very strong strong views about that. So that's me. Okay, excellent, uh, Joe and uh, Emilian. Uh, both of you, thanks a lot for your contributions in the second part of the session. Well, it's uh, 7.33 here in uh, Florence. So that's, um, that's aperitivo time. Um, I'm glad to see in the attendees list that people are um, joining from other sides of the world where it may be lunchtime. Um, but um, many thanks to everyone for, for joining. I uh, would like to make two announcements. Um, first of all, as Emilienne already uh, referred to, most of the contributions that you've heard today will be part of an upcoming symposium on Global CIT on the topic of citizenship rev revocation, um, edited by Emilienne and also by Isolt Honehan of um, University College Dublin and one of the long-time uh, Global CIT uh, collaborators. Uh, so keep your eyes on our website and our social media for further announcements. Uh, you can, of course, also register for the Global CIT newsletter if you'd like to stay posted through a more traditional media of email instead of following us on uh, Twitter or Facebook. Um, secondly, our next um, uh, Global CIT uh, webinar will be on Tuesday, the 27th of October. And this will address the topic of electoral rights with a particular focus on the upcoming U.S. elections. Uh, the session will be chaired by Rainer Bauberg, co-director of Global CIT. Um, and um, among others, the speaker will be Amanda Klekowski. And um, we'll, we'll discuss things such as uh, access to, to voting rights, um, not only by resident citizens, but also by non-resident uh, citizens, so the diaspora engagement. And we look forward to welcoming you uh, back online in one month. Um, Thanks a lot to the staff here at the Schumann Center and also to Jelena Junkies for helping me to moderate the, uh, the Q&A. Thanks a lot to the audience for joining and, um, and giving us a lot of um, food for thoughts. We squeezed in, I think, a lot of stuff in, uh, in this hour and a half and we really covered the uh, citizenship replication from many angles, um, geographical uh, angles, but also um, substantive angles. So uh, certainly uh, to be continued. Uh, online, uh, hopefully also in uh, person um, 
when uh, when the situation allows so many thanks and and good night or good day to all of you thank you